People were passing through or experiencing an historic moment, very often are not fully conscious of the fact. Now, I choose my words carefully. Those that know me know that I'm not in the business of hyperbolic exaggerations of any sort. But this Congress will not just be any Congress. It will be an historic event, and it's taking place, as Fiona just pointed out, at a turning point in world history. There's no doubt at all about that. Now, I have a task tonight, which, she, as she said, is to present to you a document which is the draft manifesto of the new Communist International, which will be launched this summer. And this brings to mind, of course, another manifesto, which was and remains the foundational document of our movement. This is as Um, I'm referring, of course, to the Manifesto of the Communist Party, written by two young men, they were very young men, actually, uh, Marx and Engels at the time, in 1847. This document is an extraordinary document in many ways. You know, I'll, I'll ask you a question, you know, I'll make a challenge, in fact. You point out to me any bourgeois book whatsoever written in 1847, that today will have anything more than a mere historical interest. That is to say, actual application to the present world situation, nil or next to nil. But here you have, and it's, in a, and it's, it's an extraordinary thing if you come to think about it, you have a document which has stood the test of time to the point where it's actually more relevant now than what it was when it was written. <laughs> and this document actually explains that the central contradictions of the capital system. You must all read and study this document. The more times that I, that I read it, that I've read it many times, each time you learn something new from this wonderful, this wonderful document. But you see, it, it explains the contradictions of capitalism at the period, by the way, when capitalism was expanding, it was on the, on, on the rise. Now we have the opposite situation taking place. And it's very clear to anyone with, uh, with eyes in their head and ears in their, in their head, it's clear the capitalist system is now facing an existential crisis. No doubt about this. And even if, you see, many people can feel this. They feel it very powerfully, actually, in their bones. They feel strongly that something is going wrong. That there's something in the world which is not right. They put on the television set every night and it, it confirms their belief. No, 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 no. There's something badly wrong with the society. There's something badly wrong with the world. And something has got to change. Now this is important, although I hasten to add, of course, of course they don't understand the reason for it. Many people outside this organization really understand the reason, but that they feel it, you better, better, you better, you better believe it. And this, by the way, and that's something that people don't tend to understand, is a starting point. It is the embryo of a nascent revolutionary consciousness. Of course, as we understand it, Hegel expressed it very well in the phenomenology of mind. He said, when we are sown, when, when we wish to see an oak tree with its mass of foliage and its powerful trunk, we are not satisfied to be shown an acorn instead. And that's quite true, Hegel. An acorn is not a, an oak tree. Oh, or more correctly, an acorn is an oak tree in potential, but not in fact. Now that's an important distinction because we are at the beginning here of the process. And it's a mistake to uh, anticipate events wrongly. But this feeling, you know, when people put on the television set and see the terrible news of wars and crisis and suffering and killing, 
genocide and God knows what. It must bring to mind, you know what? Come is not that I'm very fond of reading the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not Sunday, so maybe I want, but that's a squeeze in one or two quotes, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But uh, yes, but you see, I guess you that, of course, that I am an atheist. <laughs> uh, I consist, unlike some of my Spanish colleagues, I am a Protestant atheist. <laughs> <laughs> the difference being that I've actually read the Bible. <laughs> Catholics in my experience don't tend to bother the leader of the priest, but that's a little bit That's not a good thing. Fear of offending anyone else. Anyway, so, you know, in the Bible there's a the book, with the, with the, the fascinating book, the book of Revelation. Revelation is the same John, which Engels described, and the brother he was convinced he's right, is the oldest book in the New Testament. Hardly mentions Jesus Christ, by the way, in the book of Revelation. You have the four. Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you've heard of that. And uh, these were symbols, if you like, of what? Of death, disease, pestilence, war, and destruction on a massive scale. In other words, what people thought at that time, the early Christians were firmly convinced they were in the presence symptoms which clearly indicated what? the approaching of the end of the world, and they were convinced of this. That's what, that's what powered them, because they believed in something else beyond, the, beyond that. The Day of Judgment, we all go into, into theology too much. But anyway, the end of the world. Of course, we now know that what, what, what they were experiencing was not symptoms of the end of the world, but symptoms of the approaching collapse of an existing socio-economic system. The system based on slavery was in the process of, of collapse. That's what it expressed. Expect. You had a similar situation, by the way, in the period of the collapse of feudalism, the feudal society. You had the flagellant sects who went around the village uh, flagellating themselves and so on. Some people have had to pay, pay for this, and they've never seen it. I've never seen any prayers in the way by some people. No counterfeitation. They were translating themselves because they believed it was the end of the world. And here again, they were not wrong. They sensed that the whole thing was collapsing. All their belief systems were collapsing. It was, it was the end of the feudal system that was approaching. And now, yes, we have something remarkably similar. And even now, I think it's quite a few people think it's the end, the end of the world is coming, but not about it. No, no, no. That's, by the way, part of the, the, the reason for the explosion of irrationality. You have the same thing as the collapse of the Roman Empire, irrational, mystical sects, and so on and so forth. I won't, I won't expand upon that point, but it's, it's an interesting comparison. An even more interesting comparison, and perhaps more precise, is a comparison with geology. If you study geology, you see that the Earth's surface is formed and shaped and created by the, the movement, the subterranean movement of the tectonic plates, which are in constant motion. But this is very slow motion, glacially slow. You can't, it's imperceptible, you can't see it. You don't know it's taking place, but it is taking place beneath the surface of apparent calm. I thought stasis is what they, they call it. This is what the geologists can go to stasis. And this stasis can last for long, long periods, long periods. But it appears that nothing is changing. The continents are firm, they're stable, they're unchanging, they never will change, they always have been like this, they always will be like this. Not so. Because sooner or later, these subterranean invisible processes involving extreme temperatures and extreme pressures which are invisible, I repeat to the human eye, nobody can see this. It's completely bad, it's beyond our, our, we can't even approach it. But at a certain point, quantity becomes transformed into quality. These infinitely small changes, suddenly, without warning, reach a critical point where the tectonic plates crash and you have the most violent, Phenomena known to humankind, explosions, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tremendous forces are unleashed, which were invisible 
Now you actually have, and I insist upon this, an identical process exists in human society and human history. This is dialectics, by the way. This is our main weapon of understanding. This is what sets us apart from all those idiots and the so-called experts of the universities, the bourgeois universities, with the letters after their name, God knows what the letters stand for. Don't, don't stand for any, anything he tells us, that's for sure. Yeah. But you know, you have this, uh, this, this marvelous weapon of analysis, which enables the communists, the Marxists, to understand the real process that's taking place, which are invisible to the majority of people, not understood. That's why the Russian revolutionary democrat, Herzl, described Hegel's dialectic, actually, with a brilliant phrase. He said, Dialectics, he said, is the algebra of revolution. What a wonderful expression, the algebra of revolution. And it's incumbent on all of us to study dialectics, to study Marxist philosophy. It's the only way that you can really understand what's taking place. And therefore, if you understand what's taking place, you're able to arm yourself to intervene effectively. And that's the name, that's the name of the game, as we shall, as we, as we shall see. Now, none of this is understood by the so-called strategists of capital. I've never seen such confusion, such bankruptcy, such stupidity. I mean, if, if you take the, the, all the politicians in the world today, Joe Biden, God preserve us. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Joe, genocide Joe. Jesus, it's so <laughs> funny. Or, uh, uh, so he saw, it's a very kind of his name was Rishi Suna. That's right. Rishi Suna. The man is a complete idiot. Macron is even bigger than the middle. He's now sounding off about the need to send troops to the Ukraine to, to, to win the war against, by the way, an unwinnable war. They've lost the war in the face of Christ. Anyone with the slightest knowledge knows that they've lost Russia has won the war. that they will with the front. They've already won the war. Their advance will be unstoppable. And even this $61 billion that they dollar thing. But the government will, will, will solve that. Absolutely zero. No effect, except to prolong the prolonged the agony perhaps for a few months. But as far as the outcome is concerned, the outcome is already determined. And already they're panicking. And Macron is the first one to panic. He's an expert at panic. He, he, must, he must have a degree in it. <laughs> but he's actually demanding that they send, NATO sends troops to the Ukraine. If they send troops to the they'll be wiped out, that's all. That'll be very popular to be elected. Anyway, but you see, the question is this these leaders are possibly the most inept, the most incompetent, perhaps in the world of history. I'm staggered, I'm staggered to the degree of ineptitude. Although I will say this, in their defense, if you like, even if you have the most capable, the most intelligent, the most far-sighted politicians in charge, you couldn't fundamentally alter the, uh, the outcome. It could not. The reason being, what the, none of these the, the idiots understand, they're in an impossible position. They, they, they're presented with an insoluble problem. They can't solve it because what we're talking about here is the fact, the fundamental fact, that the capitalist system, after a long time, when it achieved miracles, actually, let's be grateful that the capitalist system it did uh, it produced tremendous results. And that's important. Although this is based on slavery, oppression, or, by the way, I'm a bit tired of this moralistic twaddle, you know. Oh, it's all based on slavery, it's all based on that. Of course, but the last 10,000 years is based on slavery and oppression. Yes, but all of cultures, you could argue that. All of human culture is based on civilization itself is based on oppression and slavery and blood. And suffering, yes, of course, of the great majority of the human race, of course, and that's still the case, of course it is. But that doesn't alter the fact that unconsciously, that's the point, unconsciously, the ruling class, this minority of parasites and so on, have actually created the material basis for a new society, for something fundamentally different. 
opportunity to spike the economy. But that's, that's the, the name of the game. Capitalism did play a progressive role, but that's now exhausted. Absolutely exhausted, and the capitalist system now is subject, I said, to an existential crisis. That's spread it out, it's not difficult, it's not rocket science. The two fundamental barriers to human progress, to civilization, is on the one hand, private ownership of the means of production, in production for profit of the few, instead of production for the needs of the many. And on the other hand, the nation state, this fossil, this museum piece, so you designate it to a central museum, the nation state, which is too narrow to contain the means of production, the potential of production, the capitalism is established. That's all. But it speaks as well as they find the various means of getting around this. But ultimately, they will fail. You see. And now, of course, there are different means. Of course, I'm not saying that the capitalism will automatically collapse. If you ask me, are there no means whereby the capitalists can avoid the collapse? I say, yes, there are. There are certain tools which can be used to get out of a crisis or to avoid a crisis or to reduce the effects of the crisis for a time, for a temporary period of time, but only at the cost of producing new contradictions. That's the problem. One of these things is what's known what, it's deficit, what Keynes called deficit finance. You see this recently, particularly at the time of the, uh, after the 2008 collapse. That was serious. They were, they were really threatened with the collapse in 2008. And let's, let's, let's spell it out. According to the economists, for I don't know how long, the official economists, these guys with strings of letters up in the name, okay? Uh, the state, this is, this is the arc of the country. This is the fundamental, the sum total, sum total of all moments. The state has no role to play in production, in the economy. It must not, it must not play any role. But look, look, look what happened in Russell, they said. Well, uh, we, that's a separate discussion. They don't, they, they don't understand what happened in Russell. That's a separate issue. No, the state can uh, play no And yet, and yet, and yet. When the economy was faced with collapse in 2008, when the banks were faced with collapse, what did they do? Did they say, oh yeah, no, the state must intervene, carry on, the, the market forces will solve everything, in the end it will come out there because mar the market will decide, the market will solve everything. To its claims, this usual biting sense of demand, said yes. In, in the final analysis, he said, we're all dead. <laughs> That's a suitable answer to that trouble. No, they did not do any of that. They immediately came running to the seat of the government with the answer, save us, state save us, we need money. And George W. Bush was in charge at the time, comes up with a rope, a Republican who believes in solid dollar financing, a strong dollar, so comes up with a golden check. How much you want, guys? Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> How much you want, guys? A billion, ten billion. Ten minutes, take ten minutes. How many take one? Take one. Take the whole phrase. Take one down the line. And they did. And they did. They took the whole damn lot. And they saved the system. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful? Easy. Yeah, but it's a, a price to pay. Some of the students in the audience will probably realize it. I remember when I was a student. I remember one of the most pleasant experiences that you could have as a student is spending other people's money. <laughs> Wonderful, you know, you borrow, borrow off the bank, borrow, 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 borrow from the credit card, borrow off mum and dad, you know. There's a slight problem, however, with this. You borrow money, it's got to be, sooner or later, it must be paid back with interest. And that's the problem. This deficit financing, which all, they all, they were all engaged in, they, they ditched all the textbooks, they forgot all about the, you know, the state saved them. Yeah, sure. The taxpayers saved them. All of the working people saved the rich people, the bankers and so on. And they were left with what? First of all, with inflation, because deficit finance, financing is inflationary by its very nature. An explosion of uncontrolled inflation and a huge mountain of debt which still exists now and is suffocating the means of production, suffocating growth. It's a major cause of, of, of the paralysis. 
the inflation, when they've struggled not to get, they've struggled to get it under control, partially succeeded, but the, only, the, only by that the consumption, having the living standards and so on. Yes, but they, they've not solved inflation to the degree that they could, and therefore, the banks are forced to increase interest rates. Right? And by the way, there's no way that they can return to the earlier situation of easy credit, low inflation, and low interest rates anytime soon, if ever. That's finished. That episode's finished. And now they face with a very serious situation in the All the, in spite of all the optimistic forecasts, which they always, always try to speak of optimistically, all the serious economists now, you read that the serious press is full of gloomy assessments, gloomy arguments, warnings that the world economy is in a very good part of state, a very difficult state. And by the way, the statesmen, you see, I go back to the idiots in charge, you know, the difference is, look, in a war, if you're advancing, generals, good generals are very important, if you're, but if you're retreating, good generals are even more important. Because with good generals, you can retreat in good order with the minimum of loss and so on. With bad generals, you turn a, a, a defeat into a rout. And that's what's happening. These idiots, Biden in particular, the Yanks are just absolutely out of this world. Everything they do it makes it worse. A part of, the, part of the crisis, by the way, I refer to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but one of them is war. It's constant wars now. But most of which are unnecessary, by the way. Biden, the Americans, force rationalized the Ukraine to en enter into a, 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 a meaning meaningless war with Russia. That's what they would have pushed it into. It was quite unnecessary. They could have found a solution. They could have believed that the Ukraine should have joined NATO and so on, a couple of other things. That's all. No, 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 no. Can't take it away. Can't take it away. Couldn't. <laughs> the problem, the problem is Putin. That sounds a bit like Christmas Putin. Funny. Biden is he, so obsessed, he can't even pronounce Putin's name without, without spitting. You know, he's, just, he's upset. I mean, I mean it seriously. The man is upset. Pushed the, 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 into this economy. With the view, and they were convinced of this, they were going to defeat the Russians, using, not for themselves, of course, use the poor Ukrainians. As cannon fall. They were going to defeat Russia, the sanctions, they were going to destroy the Russian economy, and they could overthrow Putin, he was going to get uh, overthrown and so on. Then they could take over Russia and all its resources, and everything would be fine. Except that. Didn't work out, did it? Didn't work out at all. The opposite! Have they achieved any one of these games? No, not one. Militarily, they, they, they defeated, they finished. All the wonder weapons of the world as well, a lot of bollocks, by the way. The Russians have put these weapons on display now in, uh, in a park in Moscow for people to study these, these medical weapons. The Abrams tank and so on and so on. The leopard tank from Germany, you know. Uh, militarily, they did, they'd be defeated. The sanctions have been a spectacular failure. In fact, Russia, the, and even the IMF now, and the World Bank is forced to say, the Russian economy of this year is probably the strongest in the world, in the strongest results. So what is it all about? The sanctions have failed. The Russian economy is stronger now than what it was before. Therefore, they failed, except in one thing. They were also attempting to strengthen their stranglehold on Europe. That they've succeeded in doing. Brilliantly. Because of the stupidity of the European bourgeois who frankly reveal themselves to be miserable lick spittles of American imperialism, especially the Brits. You remember Brexit? Ah, you know, we get control of our, our destiny, our frontiers, Britain will play key role, my God. <laughs> yeah, the key role, the special relationship between Britain and America, you know what that is? It's the relationship between the butler and, the, and his boss. That's all, that's all. Britain is nothing, nothing, it's finished. That's what Germany, which was the powerhouse of Europe, has been destroyed by this policy. The German capitalists benefited from cheap Russian oil and cheap Russian gas. That was deliberately sabotaged by America. It was the Americans that destroyed the North Stream, by the way, from the other illusions. 
Now, they're not prepared to investigate that. It's, they've closed the investigation down. Because they de definitely saw the Yanks were involved. They wanted to cut off Germany's relationship with Russia, and they did this. But all of this has, it has not affected Russia in a, any adverse sense. What it has done is to make, make the world economic crisis even more serious than what it otherwise would have been. More inflation because of the shortage of oil, the coming off of Russia from world markets and so on. All the, the sanctions have led to colossal increase in prices, which every work is now in the expression. Of course, they're plowing money into the Ukraine. The Americans and the Brits, Lord Cameron and Sir Rishi Sunak, they got no money for pensions or students or education, they got plenty of money to put money in a few billion into the Ukraine, that's all right, to keep this senseless war going. That's the state of affairs. And therefore, war also enters into this, into this downward spiral. The world economy now faces a, a perfect storm of factors, both economic and political and military, which is, it will tend to, to create this downward, downward spiral, which if it's not Controlled and it isn't being controlled, and the certain stage it will manifest itself as in a colossal slump. And economic recession is on the guards, they're talking about that. But now, the Gaza situation is the same. That's having an effect, political and economic. I'll come back to that in a moment. You see, when we're dealing with the rest of war, most people on the left, the so called left, they treat it purely from a moral standpoint. But it's wrong to kill people and we're against violence and we're against war. Yeah, okay, carry them, carry them. As if the whole of human history was not characterized by violence and class violence and so on, and war. Of course, you cannot treat, the, you can't treat war from a moralistic standpoint. Of course, it's not nice. People get killed and so on. But one has to, as Marxists, as communists, we have to understand what the motive force behind war is. What the interests of the, of the individual powers are. And you see whether you like it or not, war has got a habit, look at history, of if sooner it, it brings about revolutionary consequences. It starts off as a counter revolution, that's true. But at a certain stage, people begin to think. And people be, be, think very carefully that it's a question of life and death. You better believe it. And therefore, it has an effect. It's having an effect. This happening effect, now this will be just an, an important point. One of the, more, the major aspects of the communism, the original communist manifesto, is that uh, communism is, is international. Communism is international and it's nothing. That's, and why is this? Why are we internationalists? It's not the same as the liberal bourgeois, yeah, the petty bourgeois kids, you know, the internationalists. For sentimental reasons, the friends of the United Nations, you know, they like foreigners. You know, well, we like some foreigners. <laughs> one or two, one or two of my friends are foreigners. They're English, that is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, we, we like some foreigners, we're not so keen on others. But that's nothing to do with it. Our internationalism, proletarian internationalism, is based on one thing, and that is the fact that capitalism evolves as a world system, as an international system, and therefore, when there's a crisis like the pension crisis, it manifests itself as a world crisis in every sense of the word, not, not just economic, but military. See, that the wars are taking place, they're not an accident. None of these wars are none of these wars are accident. It's Okay, and so, yes, it's barbarous, it's terrible. Somebody, some passage has once said to Lenin in the First World War, war is terrible. And then he looked at him and he said, yes, terribly profitable. Terrible. As if you could approach war from that, that Philistine point of view. No, 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 no. It's terrible. Yes, but war does have revolutionary implications. And that's so right now. I can't remember, I, well, I can remember, as I pointed to a friend in Brooks here, uh, Kevin Ramos, a few other, or Mark Sewell, a few other. I suppose we'd have to call ourselves old stages these days, sir. But John McAnally at the back. Are we, are we old stages, John? I suppose we are. 
<laughs> Speak for myself, no censor, no censor. Uh, I can remember the Vietnam War distinctly. And what we are seeing now is like a replay. History does repeat itself. So it does repeat itself. And this is very uh, interesting. You get this tremendous development, particularly in the United States, not only in the United States, Canada, to uh, even to Australia, to Paris, the similar movement is taking place. And this is, this is just what occurred before. I'll deal with that in a moment. There's lots of other, lots of other points that I have to make. I have to go without trying to deal with all of them. But this, this is, this is definitely. That's right. Yes, even Australia is affected by this, uh, this, this, this movement. And you see, the ruling class now is becoming alarmed. Seriously alarmed. You get this brutal crackdown in the States you now. Mass, mass arrest. I think, I think there was about 1,300 arrests the other day. And, uh, but you see, this, this, this is the repression. They could break up the camps with the violence and so on and so forth. Democracy! Good job they don't live in Russia, didn't it? <laughs> you know, just imagine. <laughs> anyway, but this, this, this violence itself, we'll say, this way, it won't stop this movement from violence. On the contrary, <coughs> that just shows to increase the anger and the indignation. Of people and not just students, but that's important. That must be quite alarming. There's a clear indication now that, uh, by the way, it's very the Americans have lost control of the situation in the Middle East. Netanyahu is supposed to be the puppet, but he does not just what he wants. And the situation now is, is, is harming American citizens, and yet they continue. The Americans could stop this business in Gaza immediately by cutting off the arms of Israel. They won't. Just the Biden, Biden's policy is quite clear, both in Ukraine and in Gaza and in China and everywhere else. The policy's failed. Okay, so your conclusion? Carry on with the same. <laughs> to the bitter end. That's the man. He, he's like a man in a car with no university. And they, they're, heading, they're heading for disaster. But this. Uh, Movement in the States, I've got some of the interesting quotes which I must find. You will excuse me because I get a bit lost sometimes with this. No, that's not the thing at all. Not the thing at all. Excuse me. This is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. It's gone too far. That's not gone far enough. Let's find this. Let's find this. <coughs> is decent, we will come to that, never fear. We will not let it come to this far. Far ahead. Vietnam War the Vietnam War. Well, it, it will appear. But uh, I'll have to speak to a man who didn't want to do it. But you see, the, the workers in, in this. Uh, University of California, Los Angeles, where, where the, the students were brutally attacked by a gang, obviously, of uh, Zionist thugs. Uh, brutally attacked. That caused a wave of, of anger among the workers on the, 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 the campus. I think that the union there, which is the uh, AW, which is an important uh, union, many of the car workers, but they actually have organized 48,000 of them employees are in this university and they've threatened strike action if this repression is to continue. Now, that means that the same mood now is spreading from the students to the workers. That shows the importance. I think some comments sometimes, I don't know, hope I'm wrong, but sometimes get the impression comes a bit glassy, oh students, no secondary, the workers, no message. So yeah. But don't run away with that idea in a mechanical sense. The students can have a big effect on the working class if they approach it correctly, particularly in a situation like this. And that's the norm historically. It was the norm in Russia. The movement in Russia started with student demonstrations and so on, against war and all the rest of it. Now this is the case, and you see this already. Somebody once thought, I forgot who, 
that the wind blows first to the tops of the trees. The students, by the way, it's true, you must have got away with this idea, we're not, we're not students, and reject that. The students are important as a, as a barometer. They can't play an independent role as a scientist, like the working class. And yet, they, they do act, they're very sensitive to tensions and contradictions in society, and they act as a barometer. That's what's occurring. But that in turn, the students can start to move. They will move as they did in the 60s in France. They started to move first. That can communicate, communicate itself to the workers if there's already a mood existing among workers. That's the point. And there clearly is. Because the general secretary, I've got the court here, so we must find this group. From the general secretary of this union, on the 1st of May, I don't know that it's direct, he issued a very stern warning to the authorities that they wouldn't have tolerated the pressure to do this, and the union was going to act. But on the 1st of May, he actually issued a call for a general strike, not on this issue. I think it's somewhat separate. Now, that, that shows the beginnings of a process of change taking place in the working class in America. He, he issued a call for a general strike. What he actually said was, you might think it a bit strange, because the date he set was for, I think it's March or May, rather, of uh, 2028. <laughs> you might think, well, that's a long time, but it's not as simple as that. In America, the unions have got contracts which last for four or five years, if you can't remember which. His union's contract runs out at that time. And what he's saying is, I want to make an appeal, a public appeal to all other unions to unite your contracts with our contract such that on this particular day we can all strike together and show the might of the working class. He said, in a general strike, he used that language. This is not Petrograd in 1970. I'm talking about the United States of America right now. And not a small union, but a very important workers union. And therefore, you see the work, you see there, the beginnings of a change. Okay? I don't want to exaggerate this, but nevertheless, it's of extreme importance. It's what Trotsky referred to in a brilliant phrase. He referred to it as the, uh, as the molecular process of social revolution. This, by the way, the Benson guards are half dead. You know this. They had the effect of, of, of uh, revolutionizing whole layers of you and bringing it in, into, into action. And they, they, they're drawing more advanced conclusions, not just in Europe and in America and in Australia, but in the Middle East. And that's really what is alarming, I think, the Biden and the Americans are slightly alarmed. Because the reactionary Arab regimes, <coughs> like Jordan, who scandalously participated in helping the Israelis to resist the Iranian missiles and so on, but regimes like that, and uh, other uh, the Gulf states and so on, so on they are faced now with mass, massive demonstrations. The, 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 if you think that the effect on the television screens of the slaughter of men, women, and children by the Israelis just affects people in Europe and America, you're wrong. The biggest effect is in the Middle East. There must be an absolute, well, there is an absolute mood of fury among the masses of the Arabs who are demonstrating on the streets. These demonstrations are getting more and more violent, more and more furious. Such that these regimes feel, feel the ground shaking, shaking under their feet. And it is quite possible. I don't know. Depends. Depends if this guards of business continue. But this is definitely how is, is determined to continue. Biden is doing his best to back petrol, to try to get some kind of a ceasefire. And then the other is to me. Carry on with the ceasefire. But we didn't attack Rafa anyway. Imagine. You know, puppets are not supposed to behave like that. That also shows by the way the limits of American imperialism. But he's determined, he wants to destroy Hamas altogether. He will not destroy Hamas. That's beyond his capability, he can't do it. And therefore, the longer that that provocation continues, the more furious the masses will, will, will become, with the possibility. It's inherent in the situation. You might have an, an explosive, like the Arab Revolution, which overthrew, overthrew these regimes some time ago. Now, you see, you have all of this <laughs> taking place on a world scale. There's more. I will come to the question of consciousness in a moment. 
But you see, people are beginning to draw conclusions. There is a change in the mood. But there's one glaring contradiction in the situation. And that is what? The total and absolute lack of leadership. Well, it's glaring. It's a huge vacuum, and I've never seen such a thing. And therefore, of course, the movement without leadership is limited to what it can achieve. But you see, the first obvious I think is this. The crisis of capitalism is also the crisis of reformism. Think about it, it's obvious. Capitalism can no longer afford, not only to grant new reforms, they can't even reform, afford to maintain, they say, to maintain the existing reforms, which were con conquered by the, for example, by the European workers over a period of, what, 80 years since the Second World War. Now, all these have been threatened with being destroyed, like the National Guard in Britain, across the Congress. It's been destroyed before we have the eyes. We can't afford it. And therefore, that means reformism has now reached its absolute limits. That explains the phenomenon that all of the right wing reformers now, they're not carrying out reforms, they're carrying counter reforms. They say, like Starmer in Britain, Scholz in Germany, and all the others. You know. Oh, yes, sir, if we're negative, we'll have to make painful choices. You know that? Yeah, painful for the workers, not painful for him, of course. Far from it. Painful choices. Of course, he's a very honest, you know, Starmer is a very honest man, you know. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, yes, honest too. Although no, no, that's Biden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's his name? Star. No. Sir Kier. Honest Kier. Doesn't, doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> he's honest, you see, because he, he says, well, I'm not, I'm not going to promise anything. And then, of course, when he comes to power, he will do just what he promised. <laughs> well, I suppose you could say that's honesty of the sort. <laughs> but it's not the kind of thing that would have been removed. You see, reformism with the reforms, like in Britain in 1945, they gave a lot of important reforms. Ashley Elton was just one of them. Reformism with reforms, that makes sense. That explains the, the grip of reformists in over millions of them for, for generations. You know, from Swansea, the Labour Party always went to Swansea. The uh, woman next door, Mrs. Francis, you know, the elderly Welsh woman, she said, When my husband died, he said, Vote Labour, always vote Labour, even if they put a donkey up, <laughs> which they frequently did. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference. But you see, that was the memory, that was the, uh, the, 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 the philosophy for working people. You see, that was the idea, not anymore. Because it doesn't square with the actual experience. Instead of reforms, you have counter reforms. Reformism with reforms, that makes sense. Reformism without reforms, reformism with counter reforms, makes no sense to anybody. And that will be Stalin's problem once he comes into power, as we shall see. You know, right? You'll watch it with them. With interest. So that's the right reformers. They have now become open, open champions of, of capitalists. They always were in practice. But now it's open this great that they no longer speak. In the, in the, in the, they make no effort to appear as representatives of the working class. They openly represent the interests of the bankers and capitalists, of the existence of the mission, of the status quo, of the wealthy people, and so on, of the imperialists, lastly, of the American imperialists in particular. They are warmongers. The most belligerent of war, war, war is more than the right to leave this. That, that's, that's the right one. That's clear. However, what about the left? The so called left. The left reformists. And by the way, this is an important question because some people think there's been no change since the crisis of 2008. Not so. No, no. There was already the beginnings of symptoms of radicalization, even that, even in that period, where it was manifested in a number of countries by a movement to the left, in the direction of people who spoke to them, seemed to speak in a radical language, like uh, Bernie Sanders in the States, Tsipras in Greece, Pablo Iglesias in Spain, and of course Jeremy Corbyn in Britain. 
But the, all the experience of these left reformers show one thing. The, the task of the left reformers is to cause tremendous enthusiasm and uh, 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 raise hopes in the working class, only to dash those hopes when they capitulate as they inevitably do capitulate to the right wing and to the, uh, to the most always. Yeah. And Jeremy Corbyn is, a, is an example of this. Jeremy Corbyn, who's accidentally you know, became leader of the Labour Party, that caused a tremendous response. You know, some of you have met this. Tremendous enthusiasm, especially among young people. Even in the Glastonbury Festival, he was greeted enthusiastically and so on. And that, he had every possibility in his such was to be walking to join the Labour Party. We give the biggest party in Europe, half a million members and so forth. He could have done anything. And he could have moved against the parliamentary right wing, which is a bastion of, of reaction. And with a clean sweep, he could have changed, changed the little part, actually. He didn't do it. He backed off. He took no action against these gangsters in the parliamentary little but he was openly conspiring against them all the time. And he took no action. And the reason is, and he didn't want to split in the party, he wanted unity. Unity with the right man, for God's sake. Uh, how could that, that's impossible. And of course, he, he, he paid the consequences for that. They used, by the way, identity politics, which I've done for a moment, for reaction and counter revolutionary purposes, anti Semitism. Do you remember that? They accused him, they attacked him for anti Semitism. He was not anti Semitic. It doesn't matter. They organized a campaign. I'm firmly convinced nobody will convince me to the contrary. And that assault against Jeremy Corbyn was organized by the State of Israel and by Mossad, the secret, uh, the secret police. I'm not talking about using the Jewish board of deputies, whatever they call them, these gangsters. So, and Corbyn, instead of resisting, covering, protecting it, and counterattacking, and mobilizing his base in massive support against the right. He capitulated. He started to apologize. He was, he was like, in effect, he was like a rabbit caught in the, in the headlamps of a car, hypnotized, unable to move. He allowed himself to be mercilessly uh, be slaughtered, cut down, mm. of the right wing, who then proceeded, because he was very generous to the right wing, when they were up against the wall, he saved their bacon, in effect. Okay, from the rank of five. When they took off, they showed, showed no such generosity. They ferociously turned against him and the left, and they smashed the left. And the left did not resist. They capitulated. And they are responsible for the mess that we want of the Labour Party in a hopeless, hopeless situation, that, at least for the time being. May it change in the future, I don't know. But the present situation is, is what it is. Now then, what's the reason for this? Is it because of personal cowardice, personal weakness on the part of Jeremy Corbyn and the others? No, no. It's not a question of personal courage or lack of, lack of courage or whatever. No, it's a political question. The fact of the matter is that the left reformers do not have a fundamental difference with the right reformers on the fundamental issue, which is the need to abolish capitalism. They believe that it's possible to change capitalism, to make it more nice, more humane, capitalism with a human face, all this stuff, you know. You know, they, they went to it. But this is supposed to be realistic. They accuse us, if you please, we communists are supposed to be utopians. <laughs> yeah. They're supposed to be realists. Realists? What sort of a realism is this? I'll tell you, it's the realism of a man that wants to teach a man eating tiger. To, eat, to become a, a vegetarian, to consume lettuce instead of human flesh. That's the realism. Uh, have you ever tried it? <laughs> you should. You should. I, I recommend it. You try it. I'll tell you now, you won't convince the tiger that you'll end up inside his stomach. That's what happened. They have you planned for breakfast. As the right wing have Corbyn for breakfast. <clears throat> now then, this is the, the, the lesson. Therefore, this, the left reformers must be shown to fail. What about the other option? 
the Communist parties. Okay. Well, the Communist, they got the name of the Communist Party. They have some of the symbols of the Communist Party. Communism in the eyes of our people is the party of Lenin, of Bolshevism, of Russian Revolution. But there's a small problem. That's an advantage, but it's a small problem. The Communist Party is that they have nothing whatsoever in common with communism except for the name. They become transformed into reformists, and most, at best, into the strength of left reformists. In Britain, the Morning Star is really a, it's a left cover for the trade union bureaucracy, that's all. That's where they get their money from. In Russia, the so called Communist Party of the Russian Federation is just a mouthpiece peace for, for Putin, and so on. And therefore, this is now a colossal vacuum on the left. That's the problem. Of course, rich to nature of course, <coughs> back then. Now, there was an article. When was this? Not long ago in the <coughs> Telegraph, was it? For example, Frost, David Frost. In which, the, well, the title said David Frost, he's a leading member of the Tory party. And uh, the headline was as follows. Very interesting headline. The British public is in a mood for revolution. It's David Frost. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, this is a slight exaggeration. He's, he's been in the previous, and I wouldn't agree with him. He is. But nevertheless, it's significant. It's significant. Um, let's see what, he, what, he, what he's got to say. The quote you're saying. It certainly means something. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are indications that he's got a point. Let's take some examples. There's a survey of over a thousand British adults who were asked to rank the words and phrases that they most associated with capitalism. The top results were greed, 73%, constant pressure to achieve, 70%, and corruption, 69%. 42% of the, the, the respondents agreed with the phrase, capitalism is dominated by the rich and they set the political agenda. <laughs> this is a, a, an official opinion poll of the Bourgeois writers. And therefore, there's okay, another example. YouGov, that's another polling outfit, reports that 73% of the people have a negative view of politics in Britain. And only 7% are positive. That's the point. Now, you see, you could think, well, what that reflects is apathy. Widespread anger. Not so, not so, not so. Frost says, it's quite a sharp bourgeois. I quote, the truth is that most voters pay almost no attention to politics apart from a few days at, 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 around elections. I don't blame them, he says. It's absolutely rational and reasonable to do this. He says, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen out of lack of internet. He's smart. It happens because people have switched off from the, from the Westminster game, he said. Okay, and he's, he concludes, this isn't apathy, it's a total loss of confidence in the system. There's another chap, of course, called James uh, Frey, who writes, I cannot remember a more disillusioned and angry electorate. And this cross sums up as well. He draws the following conclusion. Very interesting. This mood is ignored at our peril. He's one of the ruling class. This means something for Christ's sake to sit up and pay attention to what's occurring, really, in society. This mood is ignored at our peril, he said. I worry, he said, I worry that, that to too many politicians of all parties are utterly complacent about the implications. Now that's really interesting. If we look at the worst one I like, like uh, this man, the United States, how come the so called left and the so called communists are incapable of understanding? Because none of them, none of them have understood. Now you see what the fact of the matter is. It often happens that the serious bourgeois often come to the same conclusions or similar conclusions. As the communists, of course, from a different class point of view. But therefore, you see, what this brings us to the point, it brings us to the central question. 
Why are we advancing by the bold, audacious, some people might say too audacious, step of organizing a revolutionary communist party in Britain and as part of a revolutionary international? Why? And why now? Why now? Now, we don't know, I've already said that, we've already said a few, few words, I haven't had time to develop it. But it should be clear, this is a decisive moment of change in world history. <laughs> and certain things, th certain things follow from that. And of course, the, the, the people are beginning to draw conclusions. Now, come, by the way, in a situation like this, I go back to theology, you can have strong quantitative change over a period. It seems to be very slow. Too slow, perhaps, some comments would think. Some comments get a bit impatient. Comments don't be impatient. Impatience is not a good answer. Either in warfare or in class war, it's not a good answer. Be patient. The process will take the time that it takes. Some people ask me, hey, but when, the, when is going to be a revolution? When is the world class going to move on? I answer that. To that question, I can give you a precise answer. I'll tell you precisely when the world is moving in Britain. The world is in Britain will move when they are ready, not one moment earlier and not one moment afterwards. That's a precise answer for you. And we have, we have to follow the process carefully through all its stages. That's all. But consciousness, but this is the point. Sudden and sharp changes are implicit in the whole situation, and you have to be prepared. The fact that things are not much is happening, this, that, and yet, that may be so. Don't be fooled. Do not be judged. Do not judge the situation in a point like this. Consider the under, underlying processes which we're discussing here today. That's the purpose of this meeting to establish the facts. And establish the perspectives. Certain things flow from this. One thing that flows, as night follows day, day, is sudden and sharp changes, lightning changes in consciousness. People can, the ideas can become transformed in a matter of days or hours. It happens in every strike, by the way. Any worker that's lived, lived with that. And we must be prepared. That's the point I'm coming to. Now, there are indications. I don't want to quote all that, but I've got the quote stuff in this chat. I must have a few more minutes to quote this common chair person. Because this is important. Yeah, right. This is the quote from a chap called um, Sean Fein. He's the president of the powerful United Auto Workers Union. He says the following. The UAW will never support the mass arrest or intimidation of those who are exercising their rights to protest, strike, or speak, uh, speak out against injustice. Our union has been calling for, for a ceasefire for six months. This, this war was wrong, and this response against, against students and academic workers, many of them uh, UAW uh, uh, members is also wrong. We call on the powers that be to release the students and employees who have been arrested. And if you can't take, uh, if you can't take the outcry, stop supporting the war. You see. And on the first of May, this is what he says. This, this I must go back to words. Excuse me, Mr. Field, I must go to words. We invite other unions to align their contract uh, exp exp expiration dates to our own. We want a general strike. We want everyone walking out just like they do in other countries. Together, we will begin to flex our collective muscles. Now that's fighting, isn't it? Go on. What's your response? You sit there like a bunch of... <laughs> It's not just about Palestine, it's not just about Gaza. It's, it's a focal point, it's a catalyst which, which brings together the accumulated discontent, profound discontent, as you said. Even the vote for Trump, by the way, you know, it's, it's a mixed, mixed bag of course, but a size of the millions of workers in the States who discussed it with the Democrats, discussed it with the Biden, who vote for Trump. 
Want we don't have the little fascist reactions in the global league. It's just simply not the case. It's an expression of discontent. And the chairman, chairman, chairman is just expressing the vote of discontent. <laughs> in the speaker, which he would, of course, ignore. <laughs> Temporarily, that is. You see, now, this is the reason we can't have this habit in that. There's already elements of a change, an important change of consciousness among the youth. And here is something that's good, here is the figures. Uh, the Fraser Institute asked uh, was a poll of 18 to 34 year olds as to whether they regard communism as the ideal economic system. The percentage of the results is quite interesting. Canada, 30%. USA, 20%. Australia, 20%. Britain, 29%. Now, this is obviously under, under similar polls, which indicate what? It indicates that there's a layer of young people, in particular, not only young, but particularly young people, who've seen people through reformism and through left reformism, they've seen enough of this. And they want to go beyond it. They want to go step, take one step further. They want communism. And by the way, even the word socialism now no longer attracts. It doesn't. Now it's associated with Starmer and uh, at most of the Zambi Corbyn and so on. It's useless. It's, in other words, it's associated with reformism and ultimately with betrayal. No, no, no. These kids want communism and they know what they, they know what they're talking about. Now you see, this is why we need to take drastic action, and we need to take it now, my friends. You know, Ted Gant used to say that revolutionaries are some of the most conservative people in society, and I, I find that that's very true. <coughs> a, new, a new idea is not necessarily accepted very easily. But believe me, it's necessary. And this is not the product. Some people say, oh, no, you'll be, I will not be a bit impatient at this time. I don't know about you. I'm not that impatient for the person. Not, not use it anyway. Unless my dinner is late, then I get it. <laughs> but in any case, I don't lose this to, to a cost. I hope you're not recording this, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. It's not a question of impatience. What, what I really want to say. Don't you see? This flows as life flows day. Inevitably, from a whole analysis of the situation, it flows from the situation itself. There's nothing, nothing arbitrary about it at all. And these, when you say these, these are figures that have been 20% in the USA, and so you're talking about millions of young people who consider themselves to be communists. <coughs> well, I, I can't remember anything like this in my lifetime. I can't remember. That's never been the case. It seems to defy the laws of gravity. It doesn't. It also flows from the general situation as we've been describing. Either you understand this or you do not. If you understand it, then if you say A, then please, you've got to say B, C, and D. You see, I started by mentioning the Communist Manifesto, it's a brilliant document. I hope our pleasant document that it produces. I won't say equally as good, I hope it's uh, at least serviceable, and the Communists agree with the ideas. It, it, it expresses. Yes, but you know, ideas are important, of course. But ideas in and of themselves are not enough. They need to be concretized in organizational forms. It's not enough to go to the young kids and say, yeah, well, here are the ideas of communism. Here's what Marx do maybe for you. Do we agree with that? Is come to a study group. That's no longer sufficient. I don't say it's wrong. It's not wrong, of course. It's not. <laughs> Just not enough. These kids are looking for an organization. They're looking for a party. They're looking for us. And why should we hide? Why should we hide ourselves? Well, the we should be out there boldly expressing, look, my friend, you want to go through capitalism? Join the communists, but join us. We are the really guys. Millions of people, of course, there are millions. Of course, we cannot hope to reach millions of young people. That's beyond our capabilities. Yes, but we can reach quite a number. And I'll tell you this, this is the main thing. That if people like that, young kids like that, in every school, in every college, in every university, right? In every call center, among the messenger boys, in every football club, in every councillor's league, there are kids like this. They come to you in the street, oh yeah, I'm a communist then. You've had the experience, have you not? Yes or no? 
It's a thousand times more important. Oh, by the way, these kids have got a thirst for theory. Make no mistake about it. They really have a thirst. They absorb it. They, 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 they start trying to give the ideas. I'm just one final point because I skipped over it. I shouldn't do. Identity politics. This is, the, this is the disaster of the left. Absolute disaster. They've all fallen for this nonsense. This poison and this poison, by the way. See this poison. The idea that all oh, there's degrees of oppression and in this and there's that and there's women and there's, uh, there's gays and there's the trans and there's black and yeah, the number's infinite. This is divisive, stupid, and wrong. Come let's be, let's be clear about this. Very clear. We are communists, okay, and therefore we stand on one idea alone, a class position. Not interested if you're black, white, pink, green, or anything else, or gay, or anything you can imagine. All I'm interested in is do you take the position of the working class, yes or no? That's all I'm interested in. And all the rest of the nonsense can stay outside. It must stay outside. The kind of poison that introduces the divisions of one another. The ruling class, the censors, always has played the card of divide and rule. They're expert at it. And this is another example. It's not an accident that the, the right wing and the bureaucrats use this poison. You know, you know, against the left, actually, they, they usually done the effect against Corbyn. They finished it because he made concessions. I'll say this we stand on a class basis. That's all. Right? There is no room in our ranks, read my lips. There's no room in our ranks for anybody that makes the slightest concession to the poison of, of so-called identity politics. Our flag is the red flag of socialist revolution. Our cause is, is, is the cause of socialist revolution. And this, I'll finish on this. <laughs> Marx and Engels, for the first time, established the scientific basis for communism, whereas the utopians in the past thought that Communism was a good idea, but it shifted to a good idea. And it could have been introduced a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. Not so, Marx and Engels explained. The communism, real communism, has a material base. It must be based on the development of the means of production, of industry, of agriculture, of science and technology, which has now been established for the first time. Therefore, for the first time in history, that's the point. The material basis for communism, for a new civilization, now exists. 
There's nothing in utopia about it. All that is required is to free the productive forces, which are being paralyzed, from the dead hand of so called free market economics, of private ownership, the stranglehold of the nation state, and establish a genuine socialist economy, a planned economy, harmoniously planned in the interest of production for the many and not for the profits of the few. And on that basis, I'm going to finish on this, but it is important to because sometimes I think I'm a little bit too narrow in the way they approach this whole wonderful idea <coughs> of Marxism and communism. It's a wonderful idea. You know. For the first time in history, the first time in 10,000 years, on this basis, we be in a position to abolish the division between mental and, and physical labor. This atheism. Separating the clever few from the ignorant multitude. No, no, that's that would finish. For the first time, the mass of humanity with access to culture, to ideas, to, to education, permitting a real cultural revolution that would transform everything, it would transform the way people think, the way people act, the way people relate to each other, the way men relate to women. It's in the present barbarous center. This barbarism, genuine equality, genuine human relationships would be possible on that basis. And therefore, what we are fighting for is neither more nor less than a paradise in this world, in this life, because there is no other. You only live once, and therefore it's incumbent upon us to make use of this life for the, high, the highest possible cause, the sacred cause of the emancipation of the working class and of the socialist revolution in Britain, in Europe and in the world.